So good afternoon, everyone. If you'll take your seats, we'll begin. So my name is Michael Johnson. I'd like to uh, thank you uh, for your attendance and for your participation in the regional session of this year's uh, Regulatory Information Conference. Um, the purpose of this session uh, is to hear from the NRC regional administrators and from senior nuclear industry executives on contemporary issues uh, involving nuclear power plant operations uh, and regulation in, in the United States. In the interest of time, I'm going to do uh, just some brief introductions. Uh, of course, you know these folks well, and so a more lengthy introduction uh, would not be needed. Um, let me just start with David Liu, who is the Acting Regional Administrator for Region 1, Kathy Haney, who is the Regional Administrator from Region 2, Steve West, the Regional Administrator for Region 3, Chris Kennedy, the Regional Administrator for Region 4, Sam Belcher, who is a Senior Vice President and President of First Energy Utilities, and last but not least, Dan Stoddard, who's a Senior Vice President and Chief Nuclear Officer for Dominion Energy. So the way we run this session every year is we, we start the conversation off with questions that we've solicited uh, from the industry uh, just to get the conversation going. And so I'll, I'll tee up a few of those questions to, to begin the conversation. Of course, what we really want to do in this session, though, is to hear from you with respect to your questions uh, for the NRC, <clears throat> the regional administrators, or for um, our uh, distinguished industry executives. Um, and so please don't be hesitant to raise questions, again, uh, in the format that you're well used to. Uh, just pass them uh, to one of the monitors. Those questions will be uh, brought forward, and uh, we'll tee those up as best we can uh, to get uh, those questions uh, addressed for you in this session. We're going to do our best to address as many of the questions as we possibly can during the time that we have allotted. Uh, so um, please, uh, I'm going to just in advance ask the panelists if you'll bear in mind that we're going to try to be as um, concise as we possibly, complete and concise as we possibly can as we move through the questions that we have in front of us. So um, I look forward to uh, a very uh, interesting session. I want to thank you in advance for your participation. So let me tee up then the first question uh, that we want to talk about, and the subject <clears throat> is on backfitting. Uh, licensees are concerned uh, that inspectors are taking vintage uh, licensing basis documents and either reinterpreting them, uh, reinterpreting the meaning of the document, or stating that the original reviewers erred in approving the original license. There have been several examples uh, that have been ultimately resolved after the expenditure of much licensee staff time and management attention to resolve these issues. And so my question, uh, my first set of questions are to Steve, uh, Steve West. Um, to what extent do you believe this is an issue? And what are you doing to ensure your inspectors are not imposing backfits as a result of their inspection activities? And then after Steve is finished, I'm going to ask for our industry uh, representatives, either, um, either, either of the, our industry representatives, either Dan or Sam, uh, to what extent do you believe this is an issue? And what can or should licensees do to preclude or help resolve such issues? So Steve. Thank you, Mike. Uh, let me just answer the question first. And yes, I believe it's an issue. Uh, and I'll explain why. And I want to start with just a little bit of background and context. I don't know if it's needed in this room. I've heard Backfit mentioned in every session I've been at today. So I think it's uh, being talked about. But <clears throat> if you don't know, the Backfit rule is basically a regulation that applies to the NRC and the NRC staff. And in a sentence, it's intended to control our imposition of new requirements or staff position on licensees. Uh, I'm going to just use the term backfitting, but there's a comparable requirements for new reactors, which is called issue finality. And most of my comments will be uh, focused, obviously, on the reactors. Uh, but there are some backfitting provisions that also apply to some of our materials programs. 
Uh, so when the backfit rule is followed, it provides regulatory stability and predictability, and it does allow new requirements under certain uh, conditions and circumstances, which are specified in the rule itself. Uh, so backfitting, the word backfitting is not a bad word, so if you hear somebody mention backfitting, uh, it does have a proper context, <clears throat> but failure to follow the rule is, is a bad practice and is inappropriate. And that's what the NRC is focusing on uh, right now. And uh, there's really a, um, I think both the, the regulator, the NRC, we regional administrators and other offices in the NRC and the industries that we regulate have a common interest or a common goal in seeing that the backfit rule is, is appropriately uh, followed and applied. And uh, so just as our staff and licensee staff understand the technical area that they're responsible for, they should also have some understanding of the backfit rule so that they can understand or recognize when they may be crossing into a backfit situation. Not that that's a bad thing, but they should recognize it so that it's handled properly because we wouldn't resolve a backfit uh, issue through the inspection process, but it could kick off a uh, process that would deal with the backfitting issue if it's, uh, if it's uh, something we need to take a look at. So last year, the Committee to Review Generic Requirements, the NRC CRGR, completed a comprehensive assessment of the NRC's backfitting uh, practices, and that, that tasking was made by Vic, Vic uh, I almost said Vic Stello. Uh, Vic McCree, I did say it. Uh, <laughs> that, that tasking was uh, made by Victor uh, McCree, the, the EDO. And uh, it took about a year, maybe a little bit more than a year to do, and the CRGR concluded that there are opportunities to improve the NRC's backfitting uh, practices. And the committee identified specific areas for improvement and corrective action recommendations to the EDO. The EDO accepted all of those committee's recommendations and even added a few additional uh, uh, actions for the staff to, to take. And the areas for improvement or the areas we thought needed to be corrected, uh, and Vic agreed, included uh, the need for improved oversight by NRC senior executives and lower level managers and supervisors, enhanced engagement by the CRGR and backfitting issues, additional training for the staff, and updated uh, guidance. We have a lot of guidance. Uh, we needed to update that. And also, we weren't really doing much in the area of knowledge management, which I think you all will agree is critical uh, at this time in, in the industry's history, and so we needed to do more there. So we do, while we do have backfitting experts at the NRC, they really know what they're doing in the area of backfitting, and they typically handle the more generic activities like rulemaking, generic communications. They do a, a, a great job. Uh, but the CRGR found that um, the, the issues that typically come up involve plant-specific issues. And these could come up during inspections or licensing reviews, for example. And that was a real focus for what the, the CRGR was looking to uh, achieve. So basically, the NRC has lost focus in an area that's important to us in the industry. Uh, we recognize that, and now we're taking corrective actions. Um, so because of the extensive review that the CRGR did in its conclusions and recommendations and the response to those by the EDO and other executives uh, at the commission, including the commissioners, I would agree that there's a problem. Um, and we are taking action uh, to address it. Uh, the main thing um, I'll just mention here quickly is, is the training. Training is an area where we, we were not, definitely not doing enough uh, we had done more training in the past. We backed off. Uh, that probably contributed to the lack of focus we see now and some of the issues that are being raised. So we're doing more training. This is one way to help us to ensure that inspectors, uh, for our purposes, but also licensed reviewers, leak, or, or lawyers and others that are involved in backfitting issues, to understand what backfitting is, to recognize when you're in a backfitting situation, how to deal with it. And uh, so the training is the big thing. I really like the uh, Commissioner uh, Burns this morning kind of answered this question. Uh, and, 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 he, and he said, and I agree, I think we all agree, it, it really starts at the top. It starts with the commission. Now, the CRGR was not bold enough in its report to say that the commission needed to do more. And I don't think we thought they did. They're doing, doing plenty in the area of backfitting. But we did identify the senior leadership 
uh, which would include us here and, and above, uh, and we need to do more. So me, personally, as a regional administrator, I'm putting a focus. Uh, I'm new to Region 3, but I went in with a uh, concept or an idea or a priority of putting more emphasis on backfitting and our inspectors understanding backfitting, working with my senior leadership team. Ken O'Brien is here, one of my division directors to make that a focus for the region. We have an SES champion in the region that's helping with backfitting. Uh, so I think that will help, but it's going to take time. I've seen at least two issues since I've been in the region for three, four months, uh, where I think our inspector did not identify or recognize it was a backfit situation. And, and uh, actually, I've been getting involved in those. Those types of issues take up uh, time to kind of sort out later. That's one reason to try and get it right uh, from the start. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, what we're doing. Also, I, I know um, there, there is a backfitting. Uh, CRGR is having a session tomorrow morning, 1030, on this whole thing. I just talked about what they did and what the agency's doing. So if you need more detail on that, it's probably interesting. Uh, you might want to tune into that tomorrow, uh, 8, 1030 to noon. All right, so Sam or, or Dan, uh, to what extent do you believe this is an issue, and uh, what can or should licensees do to preclude or help resolve such issues? It's well, I'll, I'll go ahead and start, and then uh, Dan can fill in the gaps. I, I do think it's an issue, and I think it's a big issue, and I think Steve did a, a really nice job of characterizing it, and I would probably characterize it the same way. A lot of times we find an inspector on an inspection or, or a review uh, finds an issue that either challenges the original assumptions or tries to take us to a com contemporary standard or branch technical position that we weren't originally licensed to. You know, from, a, from an industry perspective, that can be very costly and very challenging and time consuming. So, you know, if we just recognize we are in a backfitting situation and call it what it is and go through that process, that's, that's I think, what we all want to do. And a lot of times I think we end up debating over whether or not we're, we are in a backfitting situation. You know, I know the rugs are doing a lot of work. You know, what can industry do to help? I know the, the rugs are doing a lot of work in talking about areas or issues that are coming up that they think may be potential backfitting uh, to make sure that the right level of awareness is out there. Uh, I, I also think one of the things that we can do is elevate it very quickly on both sides. You know, if, if we think it's a backfitting issue at a particular utility, we need to take that up have those discussions at a higher level and we need to communicate at that same level with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the region to say, hey, we think we're here, maybe you don't, let's, let's at least open the dialogue before we get way down this process and then start trying to, to come backwards. So Dan, I don't know if you have anything you want to add. No, just a, just a couple things, I mean, I think you hit it real, real well, Sam. We have, uh, we've had some issues come up during the course of inspections where uh, inspectors will try to inspect us to newer, as you said, newer design requirements and, and without having a good understanding of the, the way our plants may have been licensed in the time that they were, they were licensed. But we have been successful in working through those, those issues during the course of an inspection, although it does take, certainly take some time. Uh, what we can do to, to help manage that is, you know, first and foremost, we need to have a good understanding of our own design and licensing basis. And then we need to talk about uh, through the inspection process in terms of facts, and then, as Sam said, uh, elevate it. I'll, I'll take this, and I'll be brief with this, one slight twist on this. It's really not so much in the backfit area, but where we have seen challenges that we have not uh, been able to effectively work through uh, during the inspection is, is in, in the area of testing requirements, where we have test programs, ISI programs, IST programs, um, testing requirements that have been uh, established uh, based on the design and, and license of the plant, reviewed, inspected multiple times, and a new inspector comes in with perhaps a different opinion and a different viewpoint on that, and, and we have had to then modify our program and modify our testing requirements. Uh, we had to get to the point where we would agree to disagree and, and you know how that works out, and then, uh, and, and then move forward. The cost of those changes was not significant for us, so it, you know, it wasn't worth going through a lengthy appeal process. But it is, while not strictly a back fit, it is a similar type issue. That's why I want to bring it up. All right, thank you. Anyone else want to weigh in? <laughs> Kathy, anyone? Okay, good. Um, so I want to just pick up on an issue, or actually where, Dan, you left off just now. Um, so in, the, in, in this question relates to the circumstance where licensees and the NRC ultimately don't agree with the outcome 
Uh, and, and so the question really focuses on appeals and, and the appeal process. So um, there, there is a perception that the number of appeals of, of, uh, of green and, and uh, greater than green violations is on the increase. Um, the, uh, there is also a perception that the number of NRC denials of appeals uh, is on the increase. Um, and so I want to start off with a question first for the industry. Um, what are your perspectives regarding uh, the violation appeal process, um, for example, its, its effectiveness and its fairness? Um, and then what does your organization consider in reaching a decision to formally appeal, for example, a green or a greater than green uh, NCV? Uh, so starting with the industry. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start off with that and then, uh, and then uh, Sam can pick up. Um, we have not um, worked through the appeal process in, in, in quite some time. Uh, generally, that's because we've, we've found that uh, most all the findings are very legitimate. In a uh, couple cases or a few cases where, uh, once again, we had to agree to disagree, um, we evaluated that it was not worth the, worth, the, um, worth the effort, the regulatory capital to appeal because the fixes were pretty simple and, and not very impactful to us and not generic to the, to the industry which kind of gets to the decision-making process and whether we would appeal a finding or not. Uh, you know, first, first and foremost, if you're going to appeal, you have to be confident that you're right. Uh, you have to have a good basis for understanding why you believe that, that you are correct. Uh, then the appeal, the, the value of the appeal has to be, of a successful appeal, has to be greater than what it would take to just accept the finding and, and move on. There's no point in fighting something uh, that has no benefit um, to, to winning, and then the, really the third consideration is, uh, is, is this something that would have a generic implication or a broader implication than to just a particular station or just a particular utility? Could this be an industry issue, in which case you have to understand that, that your peers have a stake in it as well and, and then uh, make your decision based on that? Yeah, I think the only thing I would add, you know, I, as far as a step up in the number of appeals, I think that was the opening, opening comment, Michael. I, I think maybe that is, in fact, a reality. I think, you know, as, uh, as the industry looks at more and more uh, cost, looks at more and more challenges to the business, they're looking at everything they can do to save money, and that could include additional appeals. Uh, I, I agree with Dan completely as far as, you know, what goes into the thought of an appeal. Is it an industry-wide issue? Is it precedent setting? Um, but, you know, a, a lot of times I think when we find ourselves in an appeal, it's not so much appealing of the issue. It may be appealing of the significance of the issue. And, you know, things that are clearly white are clearly white. Things that are clearly green are clearly, clearly green. But a lot of times we find ourselves right at that threshold. And, you know, I think we spend a lot of time talking about you know, your, your SPAR model, our PRA model, which one's more accurate, which one has the, uh, the right inputs in it. You know, and it feels to me like, you know, rather than get to the appeal process, if we do that work up front and we make sure we have the right inputs going into the models and we get the same result coming out, the appeal or the likelihood of an appeal, I think, goes down tremendously. You know, one, one thing I might challenge since I threw out the SPAR model is, is why do you even have that anymore? You know, I've thought about that quite a bit, that, you know, our PRAs are pretty robust. They've been approved. They've been reviewed. And, you know, many times we find that our PRAs are better than the SPAR models. So just a, just a thought moving forward. Se second. <laughs> All right, so we may come back to that last comment uh, <laughs> in the panel. Um, Dave, why don't you uh, take on the topic of appeals and uh, just um, regarding the, the, the opening uh, perception that I threw out, has there been an increase in the number of appeals of green and greater than green findings? Um, a little bit about how the appeal process works and, and also how do you ensure that the appeal process meets its objectives? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Huh. Well, let me actually start with uh changing the order slightly. I'll, I'll answer the first question last. Uh, but relative to uh, how does the appeal process work, you know, the, the, the process for handling an appeal is described in our NRC's enforcement manual. We also have uh, the inspection manual chapter uh, 0609, which is our significant determination process, as well as uh, regional instructions. And, and the goal for completing uh, review, these reviews is typically uh, 30 days for escalated enforcement actions and 90 days for non-escalated enforcement actions. Uh, Process-wise, uh, for escalated uh, actions, uh, there's typically a uh, review panel that's prescribed 
although we also elect to do panels for non-escalated uh, issues, particularly if they have broad uh, impact and significance. Uh, and, and, and regardless of whether the issue is uh, escalated or non-escalated, uh, you know, the approach for the review should have an element of independence. And the approval of the appeal determination should be at an appropriate level of management. Uh, often it's usually at a higher level of management, but not always. Uh, the uh, other question was, uh, how do you ensure that the appeal process achieves its objectives? Uh, I think it's important to first define what the objective is. And, and I think the objective of any appeal process is to ensure that there is a good faith effort in conducting a fair appeal. And, and I think that's uh, achieved in large part uh, due to a degree of independence that I've mentioned before. Uh, but uh, also, uh, that, that allows the reviewers to be successful in fully considering the merits on both sides of the arguments to have some level of independence. And so I will share with you a, a region one example of a green finding uh, that was appealed uh, even before the uh, issue was uh, appealed, uh, we understood from the licensee that uh, they, they would disagree. And, and this is normal through the inspection activity through the exit meeting. We understand when the licensee uh, is uh, planning to appeal. And given the broader implications of this particular finding, uh, we had extensive internal discussions. And this includes not just the regional inspectors, but includes the division management from both divisions, divisions of uh, reactor safety and the division of reactor projects, including the regional administrator and the deputy regional administrator. So we gave a, a strong vetting before we actually issued the uh, finding. Ultimately, we supported the finding and we uh, had the branch chief issue the report that documented the finding. When this was formally appealed, uh, we convened a very experienced panel uh, I would say that we had the folks in the region that were independent. Uh, if not, we probably would have looked outside of the region. But we had uh, a division director uh, who was very steep in the uh, reactor oversight process, as well as some very experienced folks. Uh, they, uh, they convened the panel, they interviewed a lot of folks, and uh, they recommended withdrawal of the finding. And I, I think that reflects the independence of the, the finding, uh, the good faith effort, even though that even though the uh, regional minister and the deputy regional administrator for that finding had already weighed in. Uh, so coming back to the first question, has there been an increase in the number of appeals of green and greater than green findings? Huh. And uh, the answer is maybe. Um, you know, with respect to formal appeals, uh, we really have not seen a significant uh, trend a statistically significant trend in the data from 2012 to 2017. Uh, and you know, for non-escalated actions, the NRC has received a total of maybe about 10 findings per year uh, and denied roughly 75% of those findings. Uh, with respect to escalated uh, actions, there has been only about four appeals over that six year period. Although two of them were in 2017, uh, I think too early to say whether there's a statistical significant trend uh, at this point. Uh, however, I think there is a perception that, that licensees are raising more concerns about the validity of the findings. There, and, and I think that may be true uh, for, during, the, during the inspection process itself. And uh, often it's part of the inspection process where issues are raised that may be happening more frequently. But I think the, you know, these issues are you know, being part of the normal process and having that engagement and healthy communications, often uh, licensees providing uh, new information, or, you know, sometimes inspectors uh, uh, you know, providing some insights in terms of the regulation, that gets resolved. And I think that's uh, probably a testament to the inspection process and the good communications that occur that you don't actually see that increase in actual formal appeals, at least not to date. Thank you, Dave. Um, I do want to go back to the question or the, the issue that, um, that I think, Sam, you, you raised towards the end of your comment about the SPAR model and, and about, the, uh, about our um, licensees PRA. And I just, I, I, I know uh, I haven't given you guys time to think about this, but I, I am curious, regional administrators, what do you see as, as driving some of the differences, not in whether or not there's a finding, but the significance of the finding, and, and would, for example, uh, 
what would you think of the idea of using licensees, PRAs, uh, in lieu of SPIRE models in terms of uh, determining the significance? And do you see that as a way to get around some of the differences that we have? I'll start. Anyone can start with that. Yeah, I'll start. I think uh, just one thought, one of the fundamental premise going into the uh, significance determination process with it was that the NRC had an independent tool to do our own risk assessment. And so that's really why we have the SPAR model is to, so that we can take the, theoretically the same information, the same assumptions, put it into a model and come out with a result that's independent of the licensee's uh, risk model and then compare the two. And uh, are there different ways to do it? I think there are, but that's fundamentally the, the premise of the risk assessment. O oftentimes we see uh, the differences in the assumptions uh, that actually go in. It's not necessarily a model thing. It's, an it's the assumptions that make the difference. So. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree with you as well. Many times it is, in fact, the assumptions were quite frankly, the inputs that we put into the model that results in a differing outcome. I just think, you know, as, as we've evolved over time and spent so much effort and energy, and you've spent so much effort and energy making sure our PRA models are accurate, they're up to date, they're properly maintained, it seems like, you know, I, get, I understand the independent side of it, but it just seems like it's a lot of redundant work on your side for something that you could independently verify as accurate uh, without, without all the effort on your side. I, I will offer that there, there is value for independent model. Uh, I think often when we start getting into some of these issues, uh, we do see different outcomes out of the two different models. And, and I think it's important for us to understand, as an independent regulator, to have a tool to independently verify uh, the model. Because a lot of these models, you know, their assumptions, they're very subtle differences in systematic interactions or how a particular component is designed, uh, which uh, sometimes uh, makes a huge difference. Uh, I will also add that I think part of the issue that we uh, tend to have a lot of discussion on is beyond the models is uh, you know, common cause. And, and I think there is certainly uh, uh, valid points on both sides of the discussion. But I think uh, what's more important is for us to have an established process moving forward in terms of how we approach it. Because uh, without having some standardization in terms of the process and how we do it, then we're going to have, we'll be subject to inconsistency. And, and that would not, in my opinion, be good regulation. Uh, I would just add some of the strengths to the process, though, is the discussions that are taking place between um, the industry staff and then the, well, in my case, the regional um, staff about what those differences are, and, and most of them do surround the assumptions, but I would say the couple of cases that we've had in, in Region 2 um, over the past couple of years, it's really been the reflection from both sides how the benefit of those discussions and, and ultimately coming out, I think, with the, in the, the it in a, using an informed process to get to the answer. Um, yeah, I'll just, uh, we have a few more minutes, Mike. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, we looked at the, we looked at this exact question two years ago, and the NRC's Risk Informed Steering Committee, which is chaired by the Director of NRR, <clears throat> and the Industry Risk Informed Steering Committee, chaired by NEI, uh, asked that exact question, and it was assessed uh, and discussed for about a year. And I think the, uh, it did boil down largely to independence this desire on our part to have that independence. And then also there was the, the cost aspects and all the complications with sharing something that complicated uh, between organizations. And, uh, but, but under our current process, but, but we weren't being transformative then. So maybe it's a good question, maybe it's a good question to re-ask. So it, it is a good question. I'm glad you asked that question. You made that statement. <laughs> it wouldn't seem it wouldn't it? So uh, maybe in that light, it would be something worth uh, taking another peek at. Uh, but I think the way our process works, we're basically uh, sharing results and comparing them. And, and oftentimes, I think our, our answer or our final decision uh, can be changed by what we're getting from a site uh, using their plant-specific information. Uh, does, does, does work. Uh, but, but I think in theory, it's a great idea. But in practice, we just couldn't overcome some of our uh, regulatory angst. 
I just want just one quick thing to add to that. You know, one thing that we found that's very effective, and Kathy talked about this, is working together, um, get our PRA analysts with the region's PRA analysts and working together very early in the process and communicating effectively. And generally, we have found we get that that's where we get to very very similar results once we get a common understanding. That's right. Okay, I want to switch topics now and talk about delivering the nuclear promise uh, for a few minutes, uh, potentially uh, cap two. Um, so uh, we have a card that, that asks about delivering the nuclear promise. Um, and, and so I would pose the, the question in this way, um, first for the NRC, um, noting that the industry has uh, implemented many of the de delivering the nuclear promise initiatives how has delivering the nuclear promise been received by inspectors? Um, have you seen any significant trends or examples of negative or positive uh, with respect to performance of licensees? And, and what guidance are we giving uh, inspectors uh, regarding uh, implementation or their oversight of implementation of delivering the nuclear promise? So Kathy, we'll start with you, and then I'll start pose questions for the industry. All right, industry. thanks. Um, so from the standpoint of what, what the inspectors are seeing um, and, and how we're training, and I think the, um, I'll start out with, you know, from, from early on in the process, the communication between uh, NEI and industry and the inspectors, and then um, uh, understanding what, what the goals of uh, delivering the nuclear promise were, um, how you were going to get there, um, and then continuing into what the changes are. And that significant communication up front, I think, was, was definitely, a, a, if you want to call it a best practice or something very good, because it aided us in our ability to get the message um, down to the staff uh, and to our inspectors about, again, what the goals were. Um, it was <coughs> you know, still the intent to maintain the safety uh, of the plants. And then as the process was implemented, being implemented, the interactions that were taking place at the site level with regards to keeping the resident inspectors as well as the inspectors that were coming from the region informed of what the changes were and having that early dialogue to say, you know, we're still in compliance uh, with our license. Um, we're, we're not getting into a situation where we're reducing safety uh, to the point that you were getting into, say, an enforcement area. And just that constant exchange back and forth and ongoing, I think, really helped to make things go very smoothly uh, from our perspective. Now, with that being said, I would say that really the inspectors are not, you know, from, from my standpoint, what I've heard in, the, in Region 2 as well as I think it'll be supported by the other regions, is we're not really seeing any significant issues arising as any of the changes that are coming about as part of uh, uh, the delivering the nuclear promise or anything of the bulletins that would go out. So I would say, and even as we're moving into the, um, the cap uh, two changes that uh, plants are at various levels as far as um, what they're in, in the implementation stages or what they plan to implement or the fact that they, they feel that um, their programs are adequate already. Again, it's that dialogue back and forth that I can't um, <coughs> underemphasize how much uh, that that's really important that the inspectors see and understand and it's that understanding what what industry is planning to do what, at the licensee level what they're planning to do so if we do have changes at questions we can ask those questions up front uh, and then have that that shared understanding of where you're going so so really from our perspective that's a long way of saying I think things are going smoothly and the inspectors are not really identifying any issues and from the industry perspective do you think Delivering the nuclear promise is doing what it's intended to do, and and what challenges uh, did you face or do you face in continuing implementation? Let me just let me, let me start off on that, and I'll, I'll start off uh, broadly with a couple things on delivering the nuclear promise, and then maybe get a little more specific. Um, first off, the uh, you know, the the overall thrust of the of the initiative is to become more efficient, and certainly as a result of becoming more efficient, become more cost effective. Uh, but, you know, Kathy talked about maintaining safety, but, but I would argue, and we have seen this in practice, uh, where we get more efficient and where we stop spending time and energy and resources on things that don't enhance safety and reliability, that allows us to spend time, energy, and resources, more time, energy, and resources 
on those things that do have the greatest tie to safety. So it makes us more efficient, and I would argue, and, and I have seen this, uh, I think, in the performance of my own fleet, is uh, it, it makes us, it contributes to greater safety and greater reliability, and we've seen that, we've seen that in practice. The second thing, generically, is we are, uh, as I know the, you know, the inspectors are when they are out, we are very sensitive to unintended consequences, and we continually monitor unintended consequences through our, our self-assessment processes and our corrective action programs and our, and our trending. We have not seen issues with communications uh, with, with inspectors where uh, issues come up and changes come up. I think that's been the, the good communication that we've had back and forth between the industry um, and, the, and the NRC staff and the inspectors, I think, have been very helpful. Uh, CAP 2, Corrective Action Program, being so fundamental to our business and so fundamental to the regulatory process, uh, as we embark on that and as we implement those changes, that's one where we are going to have to continue to have that good communication, that good internal self-assessment process, and that good awareness of potential unintended consequences, uh, because there's, that, that's just an area that there's going to be a lot of sensitivity to, and we need to, we need to communicate very, very well uh, on, on that process going forward. Yeah, I might add a couple couple points there, and maybe just uh, fine tune a couple points. You know, Kathy, thank you for uh, your comment on that you're not seeing a lot of issues because one of the one of the tenants going into this was first do no harm, and there was a tremendous amount of change management that took place on each one of the efficiency bulletins to make sure we really understood the change and understood uh, what if any potential consequences were out there. And and I agree with you completely as far as the communication. You know, we should make that a model for how we do business moving forward in all areas, is if we're doing something different as an industry or you're doing something different, that we get the right people together talking uh, as we go through it rather than wait until we're finished. You know, Michael, I think, I think the beginning of your question is, did, the do, did delivering the nuclear promise do what we intended it to do? And, and I would say that it, it has. Now, uh, you know, we can talk about dollars saved or hours saved or man man weeks or woman weeks or whatever we want to talk about, but, you know, many of us are in very challenging financial situations right now, and we're asking for help from elected officials. We're going to state and federal governments and asking for some help to keep our nuclear plants operating for the long term, and quite frankly, we would not have had much of a case to go and make that ask if we hadn't done everything that we could do to clean up our own house before we went and make that ask. So, you know, we can debate how much was saved or we can debate, um, you know, did we move fast enough or far enough, but I, I think we, we did look at ourselves very critically. We tried to get everything that was inefficient out of our business, and once we did that, then we felt a little more comfortable standing up in front of Congress saying, hey, we need to do something to save these nuclear plants. Okay, thank you, very good. Um, I wanna switch now and talk a little bit more about uh, significance determination and the, the SDP. Um, and, so, and so the context goes, uh, the NRC's recently implemented SDP timeliness metrics and the Inspection Finding Review Board. In many cases, the NRC and industry have ex expended uh, considerable time and effort on potential greater than green issues only to determine that the issue is of very low safety significance or green. As a result, the NRC and licensees have had to divert resources uh, to significance determination for those issues where resources could have been better spent focusing on corrective actions, which licensees would have implemented anyway. Um, that, so that's the context of the question. And so I'm gonna ask Chris for you to start. Um, have changes uh, that were made uh, resulted in improvements to the efficiency and the effectiveness of the inspection and significance determination process, and have they resulted in improved ability to focus on performance deficiencies commensurate with their safety importance? And then I'll, I'll pose a similar question to the industry. Okay, thanks for the question. So the uh, inspection finding review board is part of another process, so that's IFRB, and the other process is the inspection finding resources uh, res resolution management process. So we have the IFRB and the IFRM, and those acronyms are often confused. But I wanted to read to you what the objective of the Inspection Finding Review Board uh, is. The first one is to ensure regional management and staff align on the licensee performance deficiency, the degraded condition, and how the performance deficiency is the proximate cause of the degraded condition. Two, 
that to ensure there's early alignment on the scope, schedule, uh, scope, schedule, and involved resources to support an efficient and effective preliminary significance assessment of potentially greater than green inspection findings. And then third, provide a mechanism to effectively communicate with senior, senior licensee management the inspection finding, support needed from their staff in reaching the prelim preliminary assessment decision and the appropriate time frame to provide information. So those are the objectives of the inspection findings review board. And so this was a uh, concept came up in uh, 2016. Uh, we did a pilot in 2017. And uh, I have to admit, I kind of came in kicking and screaming uh, because I know you can't relate to this, but a new requirement was being imposed on the regions. And, and I know NRR would, would say it wasn't a requirement, it was a guidance. But, um, and that is this concept of a 120-day metric. And so the whole, the whole idea was how can we get from issue to final decision in, in a shorter period of time? We were going way too long. In, uh, in making a decision, a final determination on an issue uh, from the time that it actually occurred. And so we were looking at a way to shorten that time. So the overall process is not terribly different than the uh, process that we had before where we <coughs> documented and agreed on what the finding was, identified the performance deficiency, was, it, was there a violation involved, and then what was the schedule and plan for moving forward. But the change in the process, which was piloted last year, added a 120-day metric. And that's 120 days from essentially when the event occurred or when it was identified until we issued the inspection report. And at first blush, it's like I said, it's like, well, here, here's another requirement being placed on us. And someone pointed out to me, and I've used this on the, I used this on the site VPs at a couple of meetings right after that. We're talking about a third of a year, you know, a third of a year to get from the, the issue happens until we document it in an inspection report. And I think that, that sounded a little more reasonable to me. So, um, so um, what happens is this, the, in Region 4 anyway, every week um, we, we talk about enforcement and allegations. And at the end of that, the Division Rector Projects, Troy Pruitt and his group, uh, asked, asked, he asked his branch chiefs and Tony Vagel asked his branch chiefs, are there any issues that are potentially greater, greater than green? And these are issues in the initiating events, mitigating cornerstones and barrier integrity uh, cornerstones. And the branch chiefs will talk about issues that have come up and after some initial screening uh, where they can't screen them out immediately as green, they will go on a list. And that list essentially starts our 120-day clock. And from that point on, we start talking about it every week um, and until it comes off or until it move, moves forward. Um, and so that's, that's the way the process works in Region 4. So we ran this for about a year. Well, the, the concept was to pilot it for about a year. That was 2017. Um, NRR is taking a look at assessing the effectiveness uh, of that process. And early results of the re review of that process indicate that it did impro has improved the performance and the timeliness of issuing greater than green inspection findings, that it's improved communications with licensees regarding potentially greater than green performance deficiencies, and improved our internal organizational focus and alignment on potentially greater than green uh, deficiencies. So I think there's more to come from our effectiveness or from the effectiveness review that NRR is uh, conducting, but I can tell you from my perspective, uh, it, it definitely focuses us on, uh, on the emergent issues. And the initial pushback was, well, you know, we, we now have to reprioritize, reprioritize our resources uh, to take a look at these issues. And I heard the same thing from industry. And that may be a good thing in, in some cases. It, it, you might look at it as it kind of gets all of our attention on the issue up front, and then we either take it off the table as a potentially greater than green, or if it is greater than green, then we're going to all focus our attention on it. And I also think 
the improvement in communications is a significant uh, item for me personally. I think the earlier, we talked a little bit about it earlier, the earlier that our risk analysts start talking to each other on an issue, understanding the differences, starting to work on, on the uh, independent models, I think the quicker we get to uh, uh, an answer. So that's. All right, thank you, Chris. And uh, for the industry, what can licensees do to help the process of arriving at a reasonable SDP result such that time and resources spent are commensurate with the significance of the performance deficiency? Yeah, I'll, I'll start, and then Dan, Dan, you can weigh in afterwards. Uh, bef before I do, Chris, I just want to say thank you for admitting that you go kicking and screaming every time <laughs> there's new regulations or requirements imposed on you, just like we do. <laughs> so that was uh, that was actually good to hear. You know, as I as I think about what can we do to help, let me start with I think the the 120 day thing is generally good. I think it does, as Chris said, focus us on what may be important and get us to. Uh, put the resources necessary to get to the right answer. I just would caution all of us that the 120 days I think is important, but getting the right answer is more important. And in some cases, the right answer may take longer than 120 days. Uh, that, that being said, as I, I think if we look at each issue with very open communication and, and align on what resources are gonna be required to truly make that significance determination early on in the process, you know, not only your resources, but our resources as well, I um, agree on, you know, we've said this earlier, what inputs, what assumptions are we putting into either the PRA models or the SPAR models? Make sure that we all have the understanding of the event that's consistent. Because I think a lot of times we go into uh, the beginning phases of one of these issues and we look at it and we have a view of the world and you may look at it and have a slightly different view of the world, both of which may not be completely accurate. You know, when we get together and we have those discussions, then I think a lot of times we come to, okay, this is what happened or this is what the true issue is. Um, I think that the continuing dialogue as we go through this process is important as well. Now, I know at some point, you know, you, you guys are going to be in the pre-decisional phase and you're not going to be allowed to or want to communicate that, and I, I understand why that exists, but as much communication as we have or can have along the process, I think, makes all the difference in the world. And then, um, you know, as you prepare for the IFRB, you know, being sort of a new view of the world, you know, it might be helpful to get licensee input on what you might be taking to the IFRB. Uh, just to make sure that all the facts are there and that you have everything you need to make the decision that you're ultimately going to make. And I don't know if you wanted to weigh in. Yeah, nothing, I'd, nothing I'd add to that. Thanks, Sam. I, you brought up a great point, and I should have mentioned it. So the 120-day metric, as Scott Morris tells me, reminds me, it's just a, it's a guideline. And so you're absolutely right. We want to get the right answer. Uh, what the 120-day metric forces us to do is to make that decision deliberately. So we, we'll, we'll make a deliberate decision that we, you know, despite our best efforts, uh, we're going to need more time to work on an issue, and we will take that time. And we, we've obviously in Region Four anyway demonstrated that we'll take that time to uh, go beyond the 120 days to get to the right answer. So thanks, thanks for that point. Thank you. All right, Chris, we're going to get you a question on uh, 95001. Um, that I told you I wouldn't ask you unless it came from the floor. But before we do, um, I'm gonna give you a chance to rest and let Kathy or Steve actually talk about environmental qualification. You know, there's been a lot of conversation of late about our environmental qualification uh, inspections and, and concerns, I think, uh, on, on some uh, folks' minds about whether or not those inspections will generate improper backfits. And so I wanna start, um, Steve, with a question for you, why on earth uh, is the NRC inspecting EQ at this time? And what's the NRC doing to ensure EQ inspections don't result in a backfit? And then I'm gonna turn to the industry and ask you to what extent you believe EQ inspections are necessary and what are your concerns regarding their implementation? So Steve, please start. I wanna say that I have no earthly idea, but that would just be a joke, so. <laughs> I told you I wouldn't tell any jokes today. Um, why are we doing EQ inspections at this time? Well, there's a number of reasons why we're doing EQ inspections at this time. And, and kind of if you're just thinking about the, the engineering aspects and, and
plant operations and plant aging and the need to have safe, safety systems that are available to respond to uh, uh, accidents and events. Uh, components that are environmentally qualified are important to the operation, safe operation of plants, especially in design basis uh, conditions, events. Um, so they need to withstand events. Uh, their, their last structured, really focused NRC inspections of these uh, EQ, EQ components was probably in the 80s. Um, I'm sure some have been touched on since then, but there hasn't been a focused effort. Uh, the equipment is, is aging. Uh, equipment has been changed. Systems have been changed. Uh, many probably without NRC inspection. Let's say we're picked up on a, uh, you know, one of our more routine inspections that we look at a plant mod or something like that. So that is, that is one reason uh, we would want to do inspections at EQ uh, at this time. Uh, but actually, looking at the uh, at EQ has been on the NRC's uh, wish list kind of for for a number of years. There have been a number of, uh, of reports issued by the NRC where the need to look at EQ uh, has been mentioned. And one going back to 2002 is a Davis Bessey Lessons Learned report that the the agency wrote. And in that report, for example, we said that um, there's probably people in this room that were involved in that, I'm looking around. Uh, but in that report, one of the things we uh, assessed and made recommendations about was taking a look at uh, safe generic issues that had been resolved and, and completed, by, uh, completed by the plants. And uh, actually, so following the issuance of that report, we did take a look at uh, a number of the safety issues. So on paper, we, we looked at what was out there. And we looked at about 20, 20 generic issues. And EQ was one that rose to the top as something the NRC should, should take a look at uh, at some point in time. Uh, so that goes back to 2002. Uh, there was also a Browns Ferry Lessons Learned report uh, that also mentioned, it discussed more the need to continue to do engineering inspections, and that what, but EQ was identified as one of the significant engineering programs that should be looked at. So in 2015, when we were looking at our engineering inspections and we, and, uh, we were making some changes, uh, EQ was kind of mentioned as, hey, here's something we keep talking about, we ought to take a look at, but we haven't done it yet. So this is a good opportunity to do it. It's a focused inspection in an engineering area. That's what we're looking for. It would be a good pilot to do for the engineering inspections. And actually, I think this is going to be um, uh, the results of this effort are being considered uh, by the team that's still further looking at how we're going to do engineering inspections in the future. And fortunately, there's a session on that this week, I think, too. Uh, I don't know if it's happened yet. Does anybody know? Thursday. It has not. It's, it's Thursday. Thursday? Thursday. Thursday. Okay. So if you're interested in the engineering inspections, you can get a lot more out of that. But that's why we're looking at uh, EQ now. And I'm in talking with uh, my branch chief in Region 3 who has responsibility for these inspections. Uh, I, I'm, I, the feedback I get is they're being pretty well received in, in the region. Uh, certainly at the, the engineering inspector, engineering counterpart at the site, good interaction. Uh, we're finding some things, uh, usually uh, things that, you know, that haven't been found by the site because they're not, they're not looking for them. We're out there just to look for them, so we do find things. Uh, but I think they're going pretty well, and he tells me things are going pretty well in the other regions too, uh, but I, I won't speak for them. So. Um, I don't think any backfitting issues uh, have come up in the, at least in Region 3. Haven't heard of any in the other, but I kind of addressed earlier what we're doing just to uh, head off uh, backfitting issues coming up in, uh, during inspections uh, and being inappropriately, uh, inappropriately <coughs> imposing a backfit on, on a licensee when we find something, when an inspector finds something he may not like that's been previously approved. That's an ongoing effort. I mean, I think that's something, as, the, as uh, Commissioner Byrne said today, it's continuous. I mean, there's no beginning and end, although we're certainly in a, in a period where we're trying to train inspectors better and have managers more involved. 
uh, to try and catch those things. Kind of success for me will be not when an inspector thinks there's a backfitting issue because the licensee says you're backfitting me. It's when he recognizes that there's a potential backfitting issue because the licensee says, I think that's been approved by the NRC already and you're asking me to do something different. So the backfit word is never used, but the engineer, the inspector makes the connection between what he's being told and what documentation he's given and said, oh, this could be a backfit if I pursue this. So. Uh, like I said, ongoing effort. Uh, I wanted to just take this opportunity. Sam mentioned a couple of times actually, but when he was talking about the industry perspectives on backfitting, something I should have said, because I'm a firm believer in it also, is the communications is, is really the key, not only to try and to, to, to get the proper focus on a potential backfitting issue or other inspection issues, but many other issues that industry and the NRC deal with. And uh, in, the, in my short time in the region and in the, in, the, in the meetings I've had with the site and corporate leadership for, this, for the sites there, we talk about communications and commit to one another to make sure we have good communications channels open at the various levels. Uh, it doesn't mean that I get called every time there's a problem, but I'm available if, if the problem uh, escalates to that reason. But I think communications is really a big piece of this internally and between internal and external. All right, thank you, Steve. And for Sam or Dan, uh, to what extent do you believe EQ inspections are necessary? And what concerns do you have regarding EQ uh, and their implementation? I would say generally, you know, if, uh, if an important program hasn't been looked at in a while, it, it's probably worth giving it a look. The, the question comes in is, is that a standalone focused inspection or is that something that can be rolled into another in, in, as part of another inspection to, to do it in the most efficient way possible? That would be the, the, the challenge that I would have there. Uh, we have not seen issues with backfit or, or any real, real major issues uh, in the EQ looks that we have received. The one challenge that I think is out there, uh, it's a potential challenge and I think it has been seen in some places is, and you may have alluded to this er earlier, Steve, is where there's a, a request for documentation of bases for a program that was created at some point in time. It had adequate technical basis at the time, and now you have an inspector who's asking for another level of rigor, another level of technical basis that um, it, it would require significant effort on the part of a licensee to go recreate those bases. That, that I think, is the, is the greatest potential challenge out there. And, and, I, and I, I don't have specific examples, but I have heard there have at least been some of those discussions. Yeah, the only, I guess, a couple of things I would add to it, to, you know, this may be an opportunity as we look at how we look at engineering overall. Is, is this a candidate for self-assessment? I agree uh, with, with Dan, if a program hasn't been looked at, something as important as environmental qualification, it should be looked at. Is that something we do our self-assessment on and you review, you know, just uh, something I, to I consider? Guess I, I would chime in. We do self-assess these programs ourselves. I, I, I say agree. look, I mean an external look. So. No, no, no. Yeah. I, I was just saying maybe we could yeah. use that self-assessment yeah. as the overall inspection vehicle. You know, the, what, what concerns do we have or what concerns do I think about when we start looking at something that we haven't looked at in some period of time? And that's the, that, that whole new interpretation of existing standards discussion that we had earlier, where new people are in, uh, maybe that don't have the, uh, the organizational history or the, the, the years in the saddle, if you will, and they look at something differently and then we're in a debate over how do you interpret this or how do you interpret that? And, you know, usually we're able to sort those things out, but that's time and resources for both of us when we go down that path. Um, also, you know, we, we, I, think, I think this is one of the area where you use some contract resources to come in and help, and that just compounds that problem mm -hmm. even more where the organizational history uh, doesn't exist. Uh, you know, the, the final thought I, w I would add is, you know, Dan, I think, said it is, you know, we, we see this as potentially becoming a resource intensive, and if we can find a way to meet the objective and do a good, solid review of the program and not have it be resource intensive, I think that would be well received. Okay. Uh, did you guys want to weigh in, Steve? Or I want to see you reaching for the mics. Go ahead, please. I'm just going to say one thing real quick. We we are considering self-assessments as a, a way to do uh, contribute to the engineering inspections in the future, and I think if. I'm not going to get into it here, but I think if you go to that session on the inspection, engineering inspections uh, later this week, they're going to talk about how that could be a uh, 
contributor. So it's it's on active consideration. Okay. Thank you, Steve. <coughs> yeah, I, I just want to touch on uh, uh, Dan's comment about is there a more efficient way to have done this inspection? Now, I think that's a good challenge for us to think about whether there was a more efficient way. Uh, that said, I, I think this is one of those areas that we haven't looked at in a long time. And having a pro, you know, having the, the approach that we took, we also include a significant training of inspectors to understand what the requirements are and, and, and what the objectives are. And I think in the long run, having that, uh, having that approach does provide for efficiency. Uh, we have to be careful in terms of trying to roll things in uh, and, and without that training and, and a standard approach across all the regions. Uh, and, and I think as a result, uh, we, I believe we did add a lot of value. Uh, you know, this, this is one of those issues where I think we've identified uh, a couple of issues that could have been significant uh, because uh, the, the process uh, did not capture it. And, and this is one of those areas that you know, the process is important because you don't test this equipment under accident conditions. There's not a lot of operating experience in terms of failures as a result of EQ as a result. Uh, so this is unique in that way. And, and, and I think in, in us adding value, I think there was also, um, you know, where we saw the knowledge, knowledge gap, even amongst uh, licensees, needed to be brought up to a certain level. Okay. Everyone's nodding. That was a good answer, right? Yeah. Um, so there are a couple of questions that relate to uh, consistency across the region. I, and I think I'm going to pose this. Chris, give you a start on uh, 95001. Um, and the question reads, there have been several discussions regarding differences in supplemental inspections between the regions. What has been learned regarding potential causes and actions uh, to address this? Again. Um, the difference in, in uh, thresholds, maybe, or, or the way in which we approach close out of 95001 inspections. And, and just following up on the EQ inspections, um, there's a, a similar sort of a theme about URIs have been identified in Region 2, for example, um, not so much in the other regions. And so, again, I, we touched on EQ. I want to touch a little bit more on consistency, but Chris, would you start with 95001? Sure. Thanks, Mike. So, um, with respect to 95001s, I think, uh, you know, there, we always oftentimes talk about disagreements or areas of difference between industry and the NRC, but we actually have a lot of areas where we have the same goal. And I think uh, I thought about this recently, 95001 inspections, uh, we all have the same goal. We want licensees to succeed in their uh, 95001 inspections because it means they identified the causes, extent of condition, extent of cause, and, and took the adequate corrective actions. Industry wants that, and we want it. And we also recognize that there are, there's a lot of work that goes into preparations for 95001 inspections, 95, all, all of the supplemental inspections, and, um, and that there are good faith efforts to, to do well on those. So our experience in Region 4, but before I get to that, if you, if you look at the 95001 inspection procedure, and it, it lays out the objectives fairly clearly, and that is uh, the inspectors are going out to assure that the root causes and contributing causes of significant performance deficiencies are understood, uh, independently assess and assure that the extent of condition and extent of uh, cause of significant performance issues are identified to assure that, cor that the uh, corrective actions taken to address and preclude repetition of significant performance issues are prompt and effective, and fourth, to assure that corrective action plans direct prompt actions to effectively address and preclude repetition of significant performance issues. So that's what the inspectors are tasked with when they, when they go out. And the objectives and the inspection requirements and, and even methods are described in the 95001 inspection procedure. So I think where, and so it's, it's laid out, I think, fairly clearly. I think where my experience, where we have uh, run into issues where our inspectors go out and they're looking at uh, all of the documentation uh, to inspect against these objectives. 
I think uh, two areas in Region 4 where, where we've identified the most issues. The first is in the root cause analysis, and the procedure kind of lays out six or seven different uh, methodologies that could be used in determining the root cause of the issue. But there's a section in here that um, uh, it talks about the root cause, and it says, uh, the root cause evaluation should be conducted to a level of detail that is adequate for the significance of the problem. That's kind of obvious. Then it goes on to say that um, the depth of a root cause evaluation is normally achieved by completely and systematically applying the methods of analysis described in the previous section and by repeatedly asking the question why about the occurrences and circumstances that caused or contributed to the problem. And then it goes on to say, determining that the questioning process or the depth of the root cause evaluation may be assessed by determining that the questioning process appeared to have been conducted until the causes were beyond the licensee's control. So I think that's, that's what they're going out and, and inspecting against, until um, the causes have, were beyond the licensee's control. So that's one of the hang-ups that, that, hiccups that we see is that we'll go out and we'll review root cause evaluations that haven't gone that far. And just kind of general example, um, uh, if the, like we might write a violation about an inadequate maintenance procedure. And in, in one instance, we saw that the root cause was an inadequate maintenance procedure. So the root cause essentially was the violation. So what we're really looking for, and there were contributing causes, so don't, I mean, it's not that simple. There were contributing causes identified, but the inspectors go on site and they say, well, uh, they ask the obvious why question, why was your maintenance procedure inadequate? And so those are the kinds of things they're looking for, and when they don't kind of see that, then they probe further, and if they're not satisfied in their, you know, when they dig down deep, then they ca can make a determination that it's a, a kind of a significant weakness that was identified and the objective of the inspection procedure was not met. Uh, if you don't have an adequate root cause evaluation, then essentially that very much drives extended cause, extended condition, and your corrective actions. Because if you haven't identified uh, the root cause, then it's not clear that the corrective actions are complete and adequate. And then the second area that we've seen uh, problems in is objective two, uh, objective number two, and that's the extent of cause and extent of condition. So it's not, we don't take it lightly when an inspector comes back and says, you know, identified some significant weaknesses uh, in my inspection and uh, either makes, uh, you know, makes a recommendation or a proposal that we maintain the finding open and determine that the objectives of the 95001 weren't met. And that gets all, as Dave talked about previously in, uh, I think it was denied in violations, this gets a lot of attention. And so the division directors, branch chiefs, division directors, and uh, Scott and I review it. Uh, and the inspectors make their case as to why they don't think the objectives were met, and then we move forward. So that's, uh, we can agree or disagree on whether the 95001 guidance should be worded the way it is, uh, but essentially that's what the inspectors are inspecting against. I'll just hit on the EQ question and unresolved items. I don't know why. Well, uh, on the uh, 95001s, I can't speak to how the other regions do their, com conduct their 95001s. They're using the same guidance, so um, I know, I'm confident that they're implementing the 95001 procedure in, in the same manner that Region 4 is. Uh, and similarly with the EQ inspections, I can't explain why there might be differences between uh, the regions and the EQ findings. I, as I recall, there haven't been a, there, there were like 12 findings coming out of 12 total inspections. Um, and so not a, lot of, not a lot of findings. I think unresolved items are actually good. It means that the inspectors have a question that they can't answer and they're seeking additional help in getting the answer. So I think, 
that's a good thing. I wouldn't make, I wouldn't, I don't, uh, the number of unresolved items doesn't have much significance to me. I think it's a good thing the inspectors are going to try and get the, get the right answer. Okay, so let me go to the other RAs. Is there any differences uh, between you and what you would say and Chris's answer on 95001? Um, yeah, I would just add, I believe, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that there is going to be an ongoing uh, effort uh, within the RNC to take a look at 95001 consistency. And uh, I think that's a good thing because even though you can read the guidance, uh, there's always the interpretation of that guidance in terms of uh, uh, how much you know, what's reasonable, uh, and, and I think that's going to be something which uh, this review will look at. Okay, I've got a number of follow-up questions as well, and actually I was going to wait till the end to ask these, uh, sh sort of to, to try to get a quick answer to these, but let me just ask you on the EQ and in, uh, inspection findings, have there been any greater than green EQ findings, to your knowledge, anyone? I, I don't believe there has been. I, I did reference that there was a, a couple of uh, uh, value-added uh, issues that were identified at Region 1 uh, plants in which uh, I, I believe uh, that if uh, it had continued uh, for some time, if not for the NRC inspectors identifying the issue, uh, I think it could have extended and questioned the operability of some of the equipment, uh, you know, safety, uh, important equipment, uh, uh, safety relief valve, uh, auxiliary feet water pump. And so it's hard to judge just simply by the lack of uh, greater than green that you know, there was not significant value added. Okay, so I just, um, thank you, Dave. I was gonna, as a second part to that question, it, also, it asked, if there are no greater than green findings, uh, is the juice worth the squeeze, uh, sort of? And I think, I think you would- Yes. Okay. <laughs> I knew you would say that. Um, <laughs> okay, for the regional administrators, what level of frequency of communications do you specifically want from utilities? Um, please answer with respect to routine and issue-driven communications. So I'll let you answer in any order. What, um, what frequency and level of communications do you specifically want from utilities? Please answer with respect to routine and issue-driven communications. I can start first, uh, I guess. One, two, we'll three, four. One, two, three, four. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, what we, you know, certainly I, I think the more com communications, the better. Uh, you know, we, uh, mm. we would like uh, good communications with the senior residents uh, on a periodic basis uh, with the plant manager and frequently with the site vice president. Uh, I know that our, our branch chiefs uh, have uh, periodic conversations as well. Uh, we, we do have joint uh, division director uh, telecons, telephone conferences, uh, both the R Division of Reactive Projects and the v Division of Reactive Safety, and they try and reach out periodically about once a month uh, to ensure that communications are working well uh, with, with the licensees. Not all licensees have participated at this point. Uh, we, we do have a vast majority and we'll continue to uh, 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 try and facilitate that uh, communications. Uh, and, uh, you know, certainly, uh, you know, we uh, do want to uh, have uh, issues raised up through us, uh, you know, uh, in terms of any significant concerns, particularly those areas that have uh, broad implications. Uh, you know, our goal is uh, safety, and uh, certainly we're going down the path that is not in the interest of safety. That's certainly something that we want to know and make sure that we're not uh, having that unintended consequence. Uh, so from my perspective, probably very similar to what Dave said as far as the frequency. Obviously, the uh, issue-driven communication is really specific to the issue. Um, there have been cases where I've had weekly calls and then, you know, they'll taper off to quarterly and then semi-annual. So I think it's it's hard to say specifically what it is, but, um, you know, if there's a reason to, to call on an issue, if something's changing, if there's an update, um, pick up the phone, you know, call us from that standpoint. I also, um, at, from the, Dave addressed really the division director and the, the branch chief level, but from the, from my perspective in the, the front office, I think those routine calls are just as important because it allows us to, to keep that open um, channel of communication. So I would encourage that. You know, as far as the frequency, again, I think it's really a site specific um, so I'm not going to put out there a, 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 a 
of specificity because then everybody will be writing it down and say, oh, she just put a new requirement on me. So um, I'm not going to do that, but I would say at least the, the frequency that I, I hear from the plants in Region 2 at my level is, is working. Did I just backfit, folks? Is that what? <laughs> did I just did I no, backfit? No, did I backfit with one <laughs> cause? <laughs> Um, let's see, I, I think for my inspectors and uh, branch chiefs and, and se senior leadership team, it, it's pretty much what, uh, what they've mentioned. Uh, for myself, I have agreements with, uh, with uh, senior leaders in my region, usually in the, from the corporate offices to do, in some cases, quarterly or monthly calls or drop-in visits, so I have pretty routine. Uh, but most important, as Kathy and Dave both mentioned, are the the uh, the, the calls as needed. So uh, I wouldn't want somebody knowing they're going to have a quarterly meeting with me two months from now and hold an issue. They should be calling me or the appropriate person uh, as the issue is raised. And I think we have really good uh, agreements in in the region that that's happening. So very similar. I mean, in addition to some of the forums that we have to communicate, including RUGS, uh, vice president meetings, drop-in visits, uh, the periodic calls we have right now are kind of driven more by the licensees than us. So there are some licensees, plants that I have uh, calls with on a biweekly basis, some on a monthly basis, and some not at all. Um, what would I like to see, not Im imposing a new requirement, is I, I think those communications are very valuable. Uh, I have an example recently with a plant in Region 4 where I sensed that the we were having communication issues even though I really couldn't put my finger on it, uh, and we're going to initiate um, frequent calls at my level at the uh, division director level and at the branch chief level. And sometimes when I have these call, I'll call with, have a call with Tim Powell and, and you know, usually, where's Tim? I, I know he was in here. Uh, okay, there. So, um, you know, sometimes it'll just be, hey, here's the status of the plants. Uh, I don't have anything else for you. Do you have anything for me? And, and the call will be over if, if we don't. And sometimes, uh, it'll go on longer if there's uh, more information to share. But I, th I think the other value in those calls at all levels is to ensure that there is alignment in communications at all levels. And I think it helps to establish those relationships, even if you think that you have a good relationship with your uh, region, I think it's helpful to foster the relationship so that when the tough issues do come up and those critical conversations do occur, that you've already, you already have that mechanism in place uh, to have those discussions. And I know it's helped Chris Aachen and I uh, recently to just put things on the table and talk through them and get, make sure that his organization and, and uh, our region are on the same page um, and, that we, and that we force that, not force, but we encourage that communication to go back down where there are gaps. Steve, you don't get to ask me a question. <laughs> Is it for me? Is he? <laughs> Sorry. I'm supposed um, to see that. <laughs> um, I, I want to just get a question out really quickly, and then so you can answer it, um, be, uh, noting that we are running out of time. The subject is emergency preparedness. and. And uh, it's, it's, it's a question that we got in really to see conversation, but I think we haven't touched on that area, so I'd like to quickly. Um, the industry believes that, uh, so the NRC and the industry have years of experience with the emergency prepar preparedness program. The industry believes that EP programs are sound, yet EP inspections and SDP generate a disproportionate disproportionate number of greater than green findings in comparison with the other cornerstones. And so the, the, the question really is around your perspectives on that. So Kathy, would you just uh, quickly um, talk about the EP preparedness inspection program and SDP and any plans to adjust that? And from an industry perspective, I want, want to hear from you as well. 
Sure, thanks, Mike. I think this will be the first question that we get ready for next year, because um, I'm not going to give you a, a complete answer. Um, so Mike is right. Um, it's been about 20 years since the SDP for emergency preparedness has been developed. Um, in that 20 years, we've revised it um, to make it more effective, more meaningful. Um, the concern is, does that revision need, does it need to be looked at again? And I would say, um, you know, from a programmatic standpoint, we do have a team that is looking at that. Uh, at the SDP, um, the individuals that are on it have significant NRC experience. The plan is to engage the external stakeholders to get your views on it. I know I had a case down in Region 2, and uh, it went through the SDP, you know, the finding made it out, and it was like kind of, Kathy, why, why did it come out this way? And it's like, well, the SDP drove us that way. Uh, and then you kind of scratch your head is, is are we in the right place? So I do think it, it is a good thing that we're looking at it. So this team will take a look at um, the SDP, um, make a recommendation to the senior managers uh, relative to is a change needed? Uh, and as far as in addition to the is a change needed or not, what should the scope of the review be, the effort be? Uh, if we do go forward with it. So as I said, um, we'll save this question for next year. Hopefully I'll have uh, more information to give you then, uh, just a status update. Okay. Yeah. Um, two, just two thoughts on, on this. First, on the, uh, on the significance determination process for EP findings, I think it is time, and I think I would speak for the industry in saying uh, that is something that needs to be revisited. Some uh, greater, there is a, a tendency for findings to quickly go greater than green uh, that are not commensurate with, uh, that, that just don't pass the sanity check in some cases. There was one example, it wasn't one of, at one of my plants, but there's an example where a technical support center diesel was out of service for eight days, resulted in a white EP finding. An emergency diesel generator out that same period of time, one of the most vital safety systems on, on the plant site was a, was a green finding. Uh, somehow that just doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't make sense. So I think there is an opportunity to, to revisit that. And as far as emergency preparedness in general, this is one of those areas where uh, I, th I think things have gotten much better in recent years, but there in the not too distant past, this was an area where there was great variability among inspectors. You would come to know a certain inspector had a certain viewpoint and you would adjust to that particular inspector and you either would or would not get a, get a finding. Uh, and, and there's variability among inspectors and among, among regions on that. So I think it's an area of opportunity. Yeah, it, the only thing I would add to what Dan said, and I think we're saying the same things, just maybe saying it differently, is, you know, we, we're really trying to risk inform everything that we do. And, you know, there's two pieces to risk. One is probability and one is consequence. And in EP, it seems like we're too heavily weighted to the consequence side. You know, if we went back and said, you know, what's the probability that that's actually going to cause a problem? I think some of that would take care of itself, and I'm glad to hear that we're actually going to be looking at it in the near term. Yeah, absolutely agree with that. Okay, um, just a couple of follow-up questions. Kathy, for you, what processes such as inspection procedures and inspection manual chapters have been modified to implement changes that you alluded to for delivering the nuclear promise? Um, please provide any examples that you're you are aware of? I'm not um, specific inspection procedures. I'm not aware of any changes, so I don't know if you guys are. No, I, I don't think that there's any uh, uh, specific changes. Uh, I think the thing that we remember also is, you know, our inspectors, uh, they, they inspect based on performance. It's performance-based. So the processes that may, may be changed as long as it's within the, the requirements are the processes. Uh, and, and I think uh, what you see in terms of our inspectors understanding the process, understanding uh, uh, the, the understanding what changes that you're making, I think they tailor their inspections accordingly. But still, it's a performance space, and that, that hasn't changed. Okay. There was a follow-up question, or actually a question for me, for me um, <laughs> yeah, that I toyed with not asking, but, uh, but I'll do it to be, uh, to be fair to the panel. Um, uh, Michael, how uh, is the EDO's office ensuring that the CRGR is reviewing non-generic documents uh, like TIA positions, et cetera, to protect from backfits via vehicles that are um, by definition not generic? And so um, we've been, uh, as a part of the initiative to improve uh, our implementation of the backfit process, 
um, than leading really in terms of our interactions with CRGR and in conversations with uh, the regional administrators and office directors to ensure, for example, that they avail themselves of the services that CRGR can provide in plant-specific circumstances. And so um, we think I've long been an advocate for a more active and a more engaged CRGR. We're starting to see that uh, um, through some uh, recent actual um, uh, recommendations on the part of uh, Brian, for example, Holian, uh, asking CRGR to take a look at um, issues before him, for example, the Oconee uh, TIA uh, referred to, to uh, CRGR. Um, so we think that's uh, really going to be a part of the, the formula, if you will, for us um, as, we, as we readjust where we are with respect to implementation of the backfit rule. Um, there's a, also another question that talks about, and this is for, uh, for, for any other regional administrators, uh, the, the issue is objectivity. Um, has the NRC considered rotating SES within the regions to improve objectivity uh, in inspection and decision making? Um, so talk about, if you will, just a little bit, your philosophy on rotation uh, within the region, the rotation that happens between regions and between the regions and headquarters, um, and the, the ability of that to help us with objectivity. I can start. Um, I think the, uh, we do have the ability to, to rotate individuals within the region, uh, most recently in Region um, 2 because of just uh, resources we've reorganized in both um, DRS and DRP, which resulted in um, uh, different changes at the branch chief level of over different plants. So I think that it is a positive thing to have the fresh eyes, but at the same time, we're not going into it blindly because we know that there's the knowledge transfer that needs to occur um, and that we're not starting over from ground zero. And that, uh, and also I think it was maybe one of the early questions. I think it was um, Sam that you said that, you know, as you bring new eyes out there, you know, they're, they're looking differently, which there's a good thing, but you have to make sure they're looking at the right thing, which is really what, what I was hearing you say. I don't think I paraphrased you exactly, but, but that, was, that was what I heard. Um, I think there is a benefit to um, not just at the branch chief level, at the inspector level. Uh, again, it's the aspect of having the fresh eyes, and then too, at the right time, um, moving at the division uh, director level. We haven't really moved in region two at the division director uh, level in the last couple of years, but there is, you know, we need to balance that fresh eyes against continuity, and that's something that I think we face all the time in our jobs. Okay. I agree with everything Kathy said. I think you're looking at the product of just what the question asked. I think all four of us have been in different regions or headquarters and regions, so you have that aspect of it. We do rotate branch chiefs from time to time and, uh, and also division management from time to time. Yeah, I, I agree with what, uh, what my colleagues have said. I think we do encourage SES managers to rotate. Uh, either temporarily or permanently, and some do. I've been to headquarters in regions back and forth a couple of times, and others in the region have also. Um, so. Okay. All right. Very good. I hear someone's alarm going off. I think their watches are a little bit fast. Um, all right. So in the last minute or two that we have in the session, I'm going to ask each of the panelists, um, who I think have been very good, actually, right? Don't you agree? Yeah. I'm going to ask each of the panelists that if you had to leave with one thought um, based on uh, experience in your region, something that keeps you up at night, uh, something that you want to focus on, for my industry uh, participants, Sam, Dan, uh, something. Uh, that you want to leave for the crowd in the last, in 30 seconds, please, Chris, no more than 30 seconds, Chris. Um, um, wow. We'll start with, in any order, um, please, someone. Go ahead, Chris. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Uh, I, I guess uh, if I had to leave with any thought is, uh, I think, uh, you know, change is always hard to manage, and we need to make, we need to manage that well. And why refer to is, you know, you know, people are our greatest resource. They're the, they're the folks that actually uh, ensure safety. And we talked a lot about culture. I heard this morning a lot of culture, but we need to make very clear distinctions between safety culture and the other aspects of culture that we're talking about. Uh, and and uh, I, I think uh, 
often when we talk about it, it has to be, it's, it's hard to discuss a topic like culture in an all employees meeting or through uh, communications from email. I think it has to be a one-on-one -on -one individual discussion on issue by issue. Uh, so, you know, I think uh, as we, uh, as we move toward transformation, innovation, uh, we need to think in terms of culture. We need to change the culture, but we need to define what culture we're talking about and how we do that. So I'll go also to the people aspect, and I'll go to it from the standpoint of the right critical skills. Um, we mentioned just talking about moving people around, but we need to make sure as we put individuals into the different jobs and we bring new individuals into our organizations, both on the NRC side and industry, that, that they have the right training and the background to do the jobs. Um, my specific references into the engineering departments, and again, and it's both sides, and it's really um, making sure that we're capturing that knowledge and setting up all of our individuals for success. Uh, most of our, of our discussion today has been about what's wrong and what are we doing about it, but I just want to recognize the hundreds of NRC inspectors who, that are out in the field right now <clears throat> doing inspections. That's what they do. And uh, I think the NRC and the licensees would agree that most of the interactions, even when there's a finding involved, are, uh, are professional, uh, satisfactory, and fair. They're helped by SRAs in the region and their branch chiefs, most of that's most of the help they get and also experts from headquarters. Okay, in the 30 seconds that I have, uh, yes. I'll, just, I'll just tell you I'm marked up all trained. Uh, now, I, I'll be a little more tactical. I, I just want to draw your attention to two uh, recent NRC actions that were taken, one with Southern Company and one with Entergy related to uh, integrity issues among uh, plant operators and um, in one case an exam proctor. If you're not aware of this, uh, the confirmatory order will be publicly, to Entergy will be publicly available today. The information is out there for Southern. Uh, by all measures, I think the companies identified very good corrective actions to address these issues. Um, I encourage other utilities to learn as much you, as you can uh, about what happened in these companies and take a look within your own company. Take a, ask how they got to where they got, how they investigated it, and uh, take a look internally at your own companies and your own plants uh, so that we don't end up uh, issuing additional regulatory actions at your plant. Yeah, I guess I'll, uh, I'll go next and since we're just going down the road. You know, I, <clears throat> I see this as one of the most challenging times um, that I've seen in my career for the nuclear industry as a whole, including the regulator, INPO, everyone around the industry. You know, new technologies <clears throat> and political winds are challenging our very existence. And I think the opportunity for us to innovate, I think the opportunity opportunity for us to transform how we do business is, is real and quite frankly I think it's needed and it's needed urgently and given all that I think we can do it and we can come out of it safer more effective more reliable and something that we're all proud of you know I've been in this industry for many many years and many of you know that I'm no longer going to be a nuke effective last week I'm going to be running the utilities side of the business but I've been in this industry for 30 years because I believe in it and I believe in what we do. We make people's lives better by giving them electricity without impacting the environment. And let's make sure we are able to keep doing that for the long term. Okay. Thank you, Sam. Uh, that, that would have been a great note to end on. Um, but since I'm <laughs> at the end of the row, uh, I'm, I'm just going to come back to, 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 to something that, that, that Chris said and, and, and something that Kathy said earlier and that's been alluded to before here. Um, first and foremost, for us in the industry, uh, it's about making sure that we consistently do the right thing to the highest standards of integrity and that we, uh, we build that reputation for always doing the right thing. And secondly, that goes along with that is establishing good communications on an ongoing basis such that we have a mutual um, respect, uh, a relationship of mutual trust and respect. We need to build that every day because there will come a day when you have to call upon that, that, that reservoir of trust. 
Um, we had experienced it um, at North Anna when we had the earthquake in 2011. Because we had built that trust, because we had built that reputation, we were able to get those units re restarted um, very quickly. And I would also just, just again commend the, the folks at the NRC. We have, over time, had a very strong and productive uh, relationship and mutually beneficial relationship, understanding the, difference of the, the, the differences in what we do, but also the mutual objective to ensure the safe operation of these plants. So thanks. So that concludes our session. I want to thank you for your attention uh, and your engagement during the session. I want to thank you again, uh, the distinguished panel, uh, for great answers and a great closing uh, set of statements. So please enjoy the rest of the rest.